Welcome to Living in the World International Church. We are here as doers of God's Word with signs and wonders following. If you want more information about our ministry, visit us at www.litweek.org or email us at info at litweek.org. You will never be the same again. Now it's time to listen to God's Word from Pastor Femi Alaren. Be blessed as you listen. Hallelujah, praise the name of Jesus Christ. Good evening and welcome to our midweek ministration. It's good to be here again teaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's always a pleasure and a privilege to bring the word of the Lord to you. The month of July is an exceptional one. We have been looking at the subject of the Holy Spirit, a person of the Holy Spirit. And we have been getting more acquainted and more familiar with his personality, with his nature and the way he operates. I would like us to look at the fruit of the Spirit, which is listed in the books of Galatians chapter 5 from 22 to 23. The Bible says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Because against such there is no law. Galatians 5, 22 to 23. What we're going to be doing is actually split those nine fruit into three parts. So tonight we're going to look at the subject of love, joy, and peace. And on, then on Sunday we look at long-suffering, kindness, and goodness. And the last um, midweek service for the month of July, we look at um, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. This helps us to assimilate the fruit of the Spirit. And look at our life, look at our lives and be able to say retrospectively what area we need to have the fruit of the Spirit matured. And then we can progress in our walk with God. You see, Christians are to generate or produce the fruit of the Spirit in their lives. For it's evidence that we are living for God. The fruit is the outward expression of our, of our inward nature. Now, this does not happen overnight because nobody plants a seed one day and expects fruit the next day. So it will take time. It will take a process of maturity. The good thing is that God has given us the Holy Spirit to help us in our journey. For he has not left us without the comforter. And I'm believing that in this season, each and every one of us will have an encounter that will last us a lifetime with the Holy Spirit. In the precious name of Jesus Christ. Now, shall we pray? Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we give you glory and honor. We bless your holy name. We thank you so much for the month of July. Thank you for the blessings we have received, for the miracles, the testimony, the signs and wonders. All power and all glory to you. My Father and my God, as we sit at your feet to learn your word, please open our eyes of understanding. Now reveal and teach us the fruit of the Spirit. Help us to see areas of our life where we need the fruit to be matured. To the glory and praise of your holy name. We thank you, the Almighty God. In Jesus' precious name, we have prayed. Amen. Praise the name of Jesus Christ. Now, the fruit of the Spirit is the nine characteristics of the life of Christ. Jesus demonstrated love. He demonstrated joy. Even when he was being persecuted, he rejoiced in the Spirit. And he is called the Prince of Peace. So, Jesus typifies what a Christian should look like. That's why the Bible calls him the firstborn of the new creature. But when the Holy Spirit has come into the world from the day of Pentecost... You see, he must control our life and not our flesh. This is how or why we must produce the fruit of the Spirit. It shows that truly we are walking in the Holy Spirit or we are walking with God. The fruit of the Spirit is the physical manifestation of a Christian, a Christian that is transformed. Your life shows that you are truly transformed, that the flesh no longer has dominion over your life. You are now living for God. You are now working for God. You are moving in step with God. And you are becoming more and more like him. Who has called us out of darkness into his glorious light. Hence, every Christian must develop this fruit of the spirit in full maturity. I know there are some areas of our life where we have some fruits well developed. And the others we are still struggling. And I'm believing that God in this season will reveal to us areas of our life because many of us cannot see ourselves as we ought to see ourselves. And the words of God that we know is the mirror and it reflects our true image so that we can see areas where we need work 
and then we can begin to pray earnestly towards uh, the Holy Spirit to help us. Now, the first one I would like to look at tonight is love. Now, love is a word that is often used by many people. Often, I can say the most used words, a word in our environment or society. And oftentimes, we have misunderstood what love means. Love is an overworked word for an underemployed emotion. It's often used frivolously to qualify things that we don't actually need to use the word love for. And because of that, we have a misconception of what love is meant to be. And many of us cannot actually identify love when they actually stand us in the face. Because everything around us has been told that we, we actually love. For example, somebody say, I love hamburger. Or we, I love fries. Or I love TV. And so on and so on and so forth. And that has um, destroyed the view or the Bible's view of what love is meant to be. Now, some misconceptions that we might have is that love equates to sex. And this is actually absolutely wrong. Why? Because if love was equated to sex, then prostitute must be the person that gives the most love. So love has nothing to do with sex. Number two, another misconception is that love has to do with indulgence. So for example, a parent that buys his child an expensive um, toy or item or gift means that he loves the child. No, not necessarily. Because indulgence might just mean that you're spoiling the child. And remember, the Bible says do not spare the child to, or do not spare the rod to spoil the child. Number three is that tolerance is also equated to love. Now, in our day and time, we are told to be very tolerant of other people, of, of other cultures, of other nations, of other religions, of other races, and, and we're told to be tolerant of lifestyles, of people, including the same-sex marriage, including things that very, very clearly in the scriptures, God said no to, because we are trying to be tolerant. Now, it doesn't mean I hate you if I tell you the truth because I'm trying to save your soul from perishing in hell. And this is something that we often misconceive within the scriptures. Now, the Bible, or we can classify, as C.S. Um, Lewis uh, classified it into four categories. Love can be classified into four main categories. Now, the first one is Eros. Now, Eros comes from the English word erotic, which means sexual love, so to say, romantic feelings and that kind of thing. And, you know, many of people equate love to be a sexual feeling or sensual feeling. And this is often a wrong category of love that many of us fall into. Because after a while, because this kind of love does not stand the test of time, we find ourselves in a divorce court or breaking up or heartbroken because this is based on very shallow foundations, so to say. Then number two, we have the storage, which is something that um, we can classify the kind of love a, a father has to a son or a brother has to his own brother, members of family have to each other. We often say blood is thicker than water. So we often have family events where we all join together because we have a kind of storage love for each other. We have to remain family regardless because our blood relates us together. Then the third one is we have filial, which is a friendship kind of love, a brotherly love kind of say, uh, so to say rather. And this kind of love a brother has to his friend. You know, you have three pieces of, or four, four pieces of um, sweet, and you give two to your brother because you have a friendship kind of love to him. is something very powerful. Oftentimes, people get into occultic groups because they want to experience filial kind of love, the kind of brotherly kind of love where they can call somebody their brother. And the last but not least is the agape love, which is the sacrificial kind of love. Jesus said in the books of John, chapter 15, verse 13, John 15, verse 13, said, Greater love hath no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friend. In other words, the greatest and the highest kind of love is a sacrificial kind of love. 
Paul did a good job in the books of 1 Corinthians 13 and he listed out the criteria for love, so to say. And he says, even if I give my body to be burnt and I have no love, then it's nothing. And oftentimes, this kind of love is selfless. That's why some version of the Bible refer to it as charity. Uh, this kind of love is agape kind of love. The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. John chapter 3 verse 16. He loves us in irrespective, even while we were still sinners. He said Christ died for us. Therefore, this kind of love is the highest kind of love. Now, many Christians do not understand this. And we have often mistaken these four categories of love into one. But I can say this, that each one of those uh, first three categories that I've listed, Eros, um, Sturridge, and Filio, often can also come under the sacrificial kind of love. Why? Because when you're in love with your wife, even though you can sacrifice your life for her or your spouse, you still uh, might do things that are er erotic so to say let me put that in let's be let's be godly in our words so we can still classify those words under those categories but love in the life of a christian motivates us in our action in our reaction we follow god because we love him not because of the circumstances that we face not because of the things that was going on around us things might be going well we still follow god Things might not be going well, we still follow God. Is our motive when we react to our fellow man, our friend. Number two, the kind of love we're talking about makes us love our neighbor irrespective of the, uh, their differences. It doesn't mean we cannot tell them the truth, but it must be told in love. We see people for what they can become rather than, for them, than who they are. There's no classification. Oftentimes, you see, people could not recognize Jesus Christ among his disciples because he pretty much looked the same like they are. In this day and age where our society is classified in hierarchy, we often find it very difficult to, to know, we very, very easy rather, to know who is boss in the congregation. So love should be our universal motive. It should be the garment that we put on when we go out of our house every day even though we meet things that make us want to think otherwise. You see, we cannot truly love others until we realize how much God has loved us. That made him send his only begotten son to the cross of Calvary to die for you and I. That's why it's not a coincidence that love is listed as the first fruit. Because the, the fruit of love produces other fruits in our life. And I want to believe that God in our life will help us have a deep and a reflective thought of areas of life of our lives where we are not practicing true love, which is of God. You know, we might have other things in our life going on, which we claim that we are doing. Good acts does not ref does not reflect you being in love, because that you must simply be indulging people. When the love which is of the spirit is dominant in our lives then our life will naturally produce joy and then we go on to joy which is the second fruit of the spirit now joy is a cheerful attitude in every circumstances of life much of our time is devoted to finding happiness when people should be truly looking for joy you see, happiness comes from things that are happening. That's why we rise and fall based on the situation of our lives or things that happen in our lives. Our happiness rise and falls on that. But joy is constant, irrespective. Joy is an inward attitude that regardless of the situation, you are celebrating. Joy is so important that the Bible mentions it several times across the scriptures. The Bible says in the books of First Thessalonians chapter 5, it's verse 18, it says, Rejoice always. Oftentimes, happiness is cosmetic in nature, but joy is a character. It doesn't change. Happiness always comes from the outside. If you're going to compare happiness and, and joy together, but joy always comes from within. It seems like happiness always meets our surface needs. 
We seem to be happy when we buy a new pair of shoes. We seem to be happy when we buy a new laptop. We seem to be happy when we buy a new house. But even after the effect of that happiness is, it seems some people might live in a big house yet are still depressed. Some people have a lot of shoes, yes, they are still depressed. They buy a new pair of shoes, they feel happy for a moment and the next moment they are, they are feeling sad again. Why? Because it's always temporary. Joy has to do with something that is eternal, which is constant, and happiness has to do with things that happen around us. You see, joy becomes more valuable when you face the darkest moments of your life. Because times can be hard. Times can be challenging. But joy is always a constant. It never ev evaporates or disappears. It seems like the way, the more the intensity of the situation, the greater the joy is. Now, let's look at the scripture from the books of Acts chapter 16. The Bible talks about the story of Paul and Salius. Paul and Salius were arrested, they were thrown in, um, they were beaten well, and they were thrown in, uh, in prison. Not only that, they had stocks around their ankles, around their wrists, so they were very much in a very uncomfortable position. But yet, they sang praises unto the Lord. They were singing praises unto the Lord. They were happy. And guess what happened? The Lord sent his angel to deliver them. We know the story. Joy is a choice to allow Jesus Christ to control your personality. You cannot overcome the world's gloom and doom without having joy in your life. Our joy comes from Jesus. So the extent to which we surrender our personality to him will determine how much joy we experience in our lives. Jesus said in the books of John chapter 15 verse 11, I've told you this thing so that you will be filled with joy, filled with joy to an overflowing, so that you will be thankful and respective. That's why, see, gratitude is always the healthiest emotion that we can display. In all things, the Bible says, give thanks. Let our heart constantly be focused on God. Rejoice always, First Thessalonians chapter um, five verse sixteen. Always rejoice. Rejoice is accounting all as joy when you fall into diverse temptations, trials, and tribulations. James chapter one verse two. Let your heart not be troubled. Jesus said, "In this world, you will have plenty of challenges." He said, "Be of good cheer, for I have overcome." John sixteen thirty three. So joy is our natural. Is, is a response to the troubled times that face us. Joy, that is the antidote to it. The world will try to depress us, oppress us, suppress us, but we have the answer of God. That's why we replace every garment of heaviness with praise, with worship, with thanksgiving, and the oil of gladness. We cannot enter into the kingdom of God without joy. This is why we need the Holy Spirit more than ever before. Because joy will come from the Holy Spirit. That's why the Bible makes us understand for the kingdom of God is not in meat and drinking, but in righteousness, in peace, in joy, in the Holy Ghost. Romans 14 verse 17. Now, we must be able to develop this fruit. And if we are struggling, then we must change our perspective. Oftentimes, our joy will come from the perspective that we have on the situation of life. Sometimes we look at things as doom and gloom. Sometimes we can look at it and say, God, I thank you. Even though I don't have shoes, I have legs. I'm grateful. Because many people have shoes but have no leg to put them in. Glory to your name forevermore. Sometimes we might need to associate with other people who are, are joyous because Joy sometimes is contagious from person to person, especially Christians to Christian. Bible says, iron sharpeneth iron, a man's countenance sharpened out of his friend. Proverbs 27 uh, verse 17. So, walk in the spirit and walk in the joy of the Lord. Walking in love, expressing joy is understandable when your life is led by the spirit of God, which will always lead to the peace of God. Now we look at the third one, which is peace. Now peace is not a state of mind 
or circumstance in nature. It is the condition of our heart. It's not our circumstances. It's not the state of our mind. It's the condition of our heart. That's why it's a fruit of the Spirit. You see, peace means we are... Um, it discusses or it defines a relationship. Peace. Those who are led by the Spirit of God, those are the people that will produce peace in their lives. And this is key to the kingdom of God. Now, I describe three kinds of peace that a, a believer should exhibit, or three ways a believer should exhibit peace. The first one is upward peace. Now, this kind of peace comes peace with God. In the books of Romans chapter 5, Romans chapter 5 from verse 1 and 2, the Bible said, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord uh, and through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have been we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we are now we now stand. Now, what that means is that the peace that we first must exhibit is with our Heavenly Father, an upward one, a vertical one, so to say. And then we can begin to talk about inner peace, which is the second one. The Bible says in the books of Philippians 4 verse 6, it said, Do not be anxious for anything, but in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your gift to the Lord, and the peace of God, which transcend all understanding, will guide your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. This kind of peace guides you from the influence of the world. In spite of the troubles, no matter how bad it is, is safer to remain on the boat with Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus could remain at peace even when the storm was raging. And that's the inward peace and that's the peace of God that governs your heart. The books of Isaiah 26 verse 3 says, God will keep them in perfect peace those whose heart is stayed on him. Is your heart trusting in God? Is your heart staying on God? Because that's where the peace will come from. Now we have outward peace. Now we talk of vertical or we've talked about the vertical one. Now we're looking at the horizontal peace. Peace with one another. The Bible says, Blessed are the peacemaker, for they shall be called the children of God. Matthew chapter 5, verse 9. We must learn to live with peace with our at peace with our fellow men. He said, as long as it lies within our power, he said, live with peace with all men. Now there's some people who are just simply troublemakers. No doubt, we have them. Bible says we should not get involved in stupid argu arguments, foolish argument that leads to nothing but produce quarrel. Second Timothy chapter two, if you read verse twenty-three and twenty-four. So we must then learn to avoid those kind of people. It's important to understand and look from scriptures that Jesus was not called the Prince of Patience, the Prince of Love, the Prince of Kindness, but he's called the Prince of Peace. Because it's all about relationship. As I begin to close, let me give you an acronym for the word peace. Number one, P, plan your actions carefully. Don't say or do without thinking. Many people, their mouth is faster than their brain. And oftentimes, they will say something they regret. But remember, words are like egg. Once they break, you can't put them back together. So let that be something that governs your heart. Think or plan before you go out and perform any action. Number two, empathize with their feeling. Don't always be willing to have your way. The Bible said, bear each other's burden. Be considerate. Try to understand people. Listen without lecturing people. Empathize with people. Put yourself in other people's shoes. Many of us are too eager. We are so eager to get our point out of the way, to say what we believe in our heart. Have you, have you ever noticed that sometimes when you get an email, you read it, and because you're so angry, you reply, and then you send it out, out to the person, only to reread it the next day and realize that the person was not actually saying what you thought the first time, but you have said what you have said, and you cannot take it back, so to say. So let's be careful before we respond. Now, A, A stands for attack the problem and not the person. Many of us, we attack the person and not the issue on ground. 
You see, we have never been taught to negotiate. Many of us, the only tool that we have in our arsenal is an hammer. And we don't have the ability to dissect or, or analyze the situation. Many people have broken up or end up in divorce of, um, of friendship have been broken down because we simply attack the person and not the problem. One way you can see that is once you begin to attack the person's personality, his image, and not the situation at ground, then you might be attacking the, uh, the, the person and not the problem. Quickly adjust your mindset. Then C stands for cooperation. Learn to cooperate with one another. Wisdom from above learns to live with peace in harmony with other people. Sometimes you will have to compromise your stand. Sometimes you will have to give and take. Don't try to be inflexible in your attitude because that will only lead to a breakdown of the relationship. Do not overcome evil with evil, but evil with good. Learn to cooperate with people. Look for ways out. Look for alternative. Every challenge of life has a solution. And then E is to emphasize reconciliation. Many times we don't want to reconcile when we have differences. We cannot all be the same. If we are all the same, then the world will not be as colorful and it, it will be boring. So always look for reconciliation and be able to work together again towards a common goal. And work towards the peace in a home. Work towards loving one another again. Because this is what Christ will do. Peter fought, uh, Jesus fought with Peter rather, because he knew he called him the devil. But the next moment, he took him up to the mountain of transfiguration and he showed him greater glory. So we must understand that sometimes we would have disagreements, but reconciliation must be in the forefront of our mind once the issue has been resolved. As I begin to close, by producing fruit in our lives, we are showing that we are partakers of divine nature. We cannot produce the fruit independently. That's why Jesus said, you must abide in me. John chapter 15 verse 5. I said earlier that fruit cannot grow overnight. So it's important that we have a reflective look at our own personal lives and begin to look at areas where we have not totally submitted unto God or where the fruit are still green. You need sometimes you look at people from afar or look at fruits rather on the counter in the shops, the supermarket. And when you look at them, they look so beautiful and delicious. Buy you, you buy about six of them, you take them home. On getting home, you sink your, t uh, your teeth into the fruit, expecting a sweet nectar to come into your, th uh, onto, into your mouth. And the next moment, you find something so sharp, so strong, so sour. Filling your tongue and you're so upset because you seem like you have wasted money. Likewise, many of us are picked green. We are yet to develop some areas of our lives. That's why we as spiritual men who are partakers of divine nature must begin to look retrospectively into our own personal lives and then begin to look at areas of our life where we need to develop or mature some fruits. This is not a gimmick. This is not anything. It's something. The spiritual man judges all things and he himself is judge of no one. So I believe that we have the Holy Spirit to help us and therefore we must begin to ask him for help to, re to reveal to us areas of our life where we still need to develop and mature. Every one of us, except you can say confidently that you are now like Jesus Christ in all ramifications, then you still need help somewhere. And I'm believing that God in this season will open our eyes of understanding. For the Holy Spirit is in the world today. Let's make full use of it so that we can get the blessings that are in store for us as a part and parcel of our inheritance in Christ Jesus. It is well with you. In Jesus' precious name, shall we pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we give you glory and honor. We thank you so much for your word that's comfort with life and power. Lord, I'm praying, open our eyes to see areas of our life where we need to develop your fruit and develop the personality of Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of your holy name. Thank you, Father, for hearing us again. In Jesus' precious name, we have prayed. Amen. Praise God.